Hi, I'm Jessie, the tits behind Titty City Design. In this six part interview series, I'm gonna connect with real people that are part of the movement. The movement is a social movement. I started to break the stigma around boobs. At Titty City Design, we believe that by talking openly and honestly about our experiences with our breasts, we can take back the power from those who over-sexualize our bodies. Instead, when we talk freely about our experiences with our breasts, we can promote body positivity. We can help educate and share resources on breastfeeding and make postpartum and the transition to motherhood feel less lonely. And we can encourage each other to take better care of our breast health because one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime. So get ready to hear from inspiring organizations, entrepreneurs, and healthcare professionals in our brand new interview series. Be part of the movement with us and help break the stigma around boobs. Welcome to Titty Talks. Join me as I talk titties with Dr. Robin Roth, a breast cancer expert and the content creator behind the popular social media account, The Booby Docs. As a board certified radiologist who specializes in breast imaging and image guided procedures, Dr. Roth has built her career on helping countless women with their breast health. It's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and in this episode of Titty Talks, we're talking about breast health and breast screening with the Booby Docs herself. Breast cancer is on the rise among young people, and Dr. Roth will be sharing how to advocate for yourself with your doctor and what you need to know about mammograms. We'll also be talking about detecting breast cancer during pregnancy and while breastfeeding too. When it comes to breast cancer and breast health, Dr. Robin Roth is on a mission to help educate others in an upbeat and entertaining way. She even hosts her own podcast called The Girlfriend's Guide to Breast Cancer, Breast Health and Beyond, where she talks to top breast cancer experts, thrivers, Previvers and those who love them. Get ready to learn all about taking breast health into your own hands and being empowered to become your own breast advocate. Yes. Well, again, thank you for being here. I'm you know, so happy to be here. Um, this is for everyone listening. This is Dr. Robin Roth, and she is also known as the Booby Docs on Instagram and TikTok. Mm-hmm. And today we're going to be talking about breast health advocacy and a little bit about breastfeeding too yeah not only am i a doctor but i also breastfed three children so yay that's amazing that is it's it's not easy (laughs) that is like one of the hardest things i've ever done was breastfeeding my three children i i did it progressively longer each time and Yeah. yeah it's that's a that's a struggle in itself so kudos to any breastfeeding mom and on and kudos to any mom because just being a mom is hard. So however you feed your baby is the best way to feed your baby. I could not agree more. It's um yes. So thank you for saying that. And yeah. um and yeah, fun fact about me and Robin is I think we've known each other uh for like just over a year now. I think it was around this time last year. Um a friend of yours, I believe, saw me at an event. And, and brought home a gift to you all the way yes. to from West Coast to East Coast. That's and right. My friend, yeah, my friend Danielle, shout out to Danielle. We always go boop, boop. Um, she found me a pair of socks and was like, I had to get these for you. And I was like, I need more. So then I came to you and we quickly connected and became best friends. We sure did. We sure did. So <laughs> that's, that's just a little fun fact. I love that. We've been in touch through Instagram and and text and just calls and um, it's always fun to it's always fun to connect with you and oh, wow. I love I love seeing your content and what you're up to and um, so yeah for everybody here just tell us a little bit about yourself and you know where you're from what you do you know sure Let's so hear. my name so my name is Dr. Robin Roth I was born and raised in South Florida I went to University of Florida for undergrad and then came up to New York for med school. Um, And now I live um, in Southern New Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia. I am a breast radiologist, which means that I am the doctor who would interpret all of your breast imaging. So mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI. I'm also the doctor that would do any biopsies if any uh, any of those tests were abnormal and you needed a biopsy. I'm also the doctor that you would need if you got called back from any of those tests. 
Um, and in many cases, unfortunately, I'm the first doctor that someone might meet when they're diagnosed with breast cancer. So it's a really important role that I take very seriously. And I love just helping, you know, all people, mainly women um, with their breast health. Um, aside from being a breast cancer expert, um, I have, I'm an Ashkenazi Jewish descent, which we'll talk about is a, you know, which has an increased risk of carrying a genetic mutation and also a family history of BRCA. Um, so beyond, and I'm a 40 something Ashkenazi Jew, I always say I'm a 40 something Ashkenazi Jewish woman with a strong family history of breast cancer and genetic mutation. So I'm a consumer of my own content. Um, I started the booby docs a few years ago. It's kind of evolved over time. Um, I started it because I was really looking, well, I, I used to love writing. I miss create, being creative. I think a lot of people, you know, going through med school and then having kids somewhere along the way, I lost my passions, mm -hmm. which was writing. And I, I always used to say I wanted to start a blog, but I didn't know like what the blog was going to be about. Like, am I a doctor? Am I a mom? What am I? Um, kind of that existential crisis that a lot of people I probably face when they're having, you know, in the childbearing years. And, um, and that's when it like occurred to me that like, I think it was actually one late night when I was breastfeeding my son in the middle of the night. So I originally started an Instagram called Dr. Robin Roth. I know, okay. genius. And I did nothing with <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> and then like one late night when I was breastfeeding my son during the COVID pandemic, I was like, I'm surrounded by breasts all day. Like I'm surrounded by boobies yeah. all day. And I texted my best friend who actually is a colleague of mine. We work together. She's my best friend from day one of med school. And I was like, I'm changing the name to the booby docs. It's going to be both of us. And we're going to be talking about being moms and being, you know, breast friends and breast health. And it's just kind of evolved over time. It's become a way of life. I mean, it's my entire identity right now, as you can see, <laughs> just because I realized how passionate I am about the cause and how there really is this lack of, um, you know, communication, direct communication between doctors and patients. And, you know, the social media is the wave of health information of the future, right? Like we know that up to 25% of people get their health information from social media, particularly yeah. with breast cancer. There's lots of misinformation out there, as you know. So yeah. it's become more, I become more passionate about this than ever. I lost my best friend along the way, <laughs> meaning like she doesn't do the social media aspect anymore, but I kept the S because I love collaborating with other individuals like you. And I say I have multiple personalities, like I wear a doctor hat, I wear a mom hat. So for me, it's the S just kind of makes sense. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah. So great. It's so great that you have this platform. I love watching your videos and they are really informative. You're, you're right. Like I go, I go to Instagram to get a lot of information myself, whether it's health related or not, you know, yeah. I, I was on there when I became a mom looking for information about motherhood and, you know, what to do with my newborn. And so there's, you know, it's definitely a first place where people go. So the fact that you're on there and sharing mm -hmm. real information and also in a way that like is quick and fun and mm -hmm. it, it's a heavy topic, but you really bring, you know, you bring your personality, the booby docs personality to right. it. And, and you really do feel like, you know, someone's breast friend that's right there to like, you know, give you the exactly. information. My whole goal has always been to like educate and empower people to like know, to be their breast, to be their own breast advocate. Yeah. Right. Because we, we know, I mean, the, the statistics are kind of startling that, you know, we know that cancer is on the rise in young people. Um, it's increasing at about 2% per year. And specifically the highest rate of, of increase was in breast cancer in 30 to 39 year old women. Wow. It was 17% over a 10 year period, which is alarming. Oh. So something's going on. It's probably not one thing, but multiple things. Mm -hmm. I think that lots of the research right now is trying to identify who these people are that are increased. Like, why are these people developing breast cancer? What are we doing wrong? And mm -hmm. Um, you know, since that's not really like, I don't think we're going to identify one root cause that if you cut this thing out, then you won't get breast cancer, right? Like it's right. multifactorial, there's complex, there's, it's complex and there's lots of things that are out of like environmental factors are out of your control, but this is where the empowering you to like, to knowing, 
you know, what breast cancer screening protocols are right for you and, and ways that you could find your breast cancer early. Cause that's ultimately like what we're left with. If we can't figure out who is getting these breast cancers, then we need to find, you know, find it early. Yeah. And that's really like one of the, the key points of my platform. Yeah. Yes. I, I've heard your, your phrase is early detection is the breast protection. Yes. I love, I should get that. Like yeah. I should have that needle pointed. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, but it's so great because you know, you're right. Breast health is super important. And, um, and just like you said, the age is, it's coming down, you know, we're not right. It, it's not anymore like, Oh, I'm too young, you know? So, yes. so let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. What, what do you want younger people to know about when it comes to breast health? Like, what are, what are the risks? Like, what should mm -hmm. you be doing? What should you be looking out for? When's like, okay. you know, the time to seek medical attention, like stuff like that. I know I'm hitting you right. with a bunch of questions. But. <laughs> I mean, there's so much we could talk about, right? So yeah. the, the age ranges that I talked about are not included in the general standard screening recommendations for average risk people, right? Yeah. So like breast cancer, you know, mammogram guidelines, 40 every year in average risk women save the most lives. Okay, so average risk is a key word. So um, we're trying to identify, you know, people that are at increased risk for developing breast cancer should start breast cancer screening earlier and do supplemental imaging. So a good rule of thumb is that we say 10 years before a first degree relative that was diagnosed with breast cancer, okay. but, not, but not before age 25 for MRI and age 30 for mammography. Okay, so let's say that your mom was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 35, okay? We would start doing MRI at age 25. And starting at age 30, we would add an annual mammogram onto that as well. We kind of usually stack them every six months. So yeah. in January, you're getting a, a mammogram and then in six months later, you're getting an MRI. So you're never going longer than six months without having some kind of breast cancer screening. Okay, so for, so, and then there's like newer recommendations out there saying that all women should have a breast cancer risk assessment before age 30 with their doctor. So having a real conversation about family history of breast cancer, have you ever, you know, do you have any genetic mutations in the family that you know of? Multiple family members that have cancers, you know, you start, oh, going back to the first degree relative, it's, it's a very high risk factor having first degree relative, but even stronger if they have a premenopausal premenopausal breast cancer. So okay. like before the age of 50, all these things go into play. All these things increase your risk. Um, another one you know, doesn't apply to most people, but it does apply to plenty, which is having chest wall radiation for let's say lymphoma. We had a, a teenager this week come in our clinic wow. for breast cancer. And it turned out that she had, you know, some kind of tumor when she was a child that had to have chest that had radiation to the abdomen, but when you're talking about a small baby, right? Like radiation gets right. yeah. to other parts of the body. So these are the things that we're looking for. These are the people that need to start breast cancer screening earlier and be referred to a genetic counselor. Okay. okay. Um, and what about like, um, so like, should these conversations be happening like at your annual appointment? Is that like, does, because like, I know like myself, it's something that I don't always feel like my doctor has like brought up to me, but mm -hmm. more that I've come to my appointment and like brought it up to my doctor because there's, right. there's a history of breast cancer in my family mm -hmm. and it was also really young. So I, you know, it was, it was me who came forward to my doctor years ago and was like, Hey, you know, this is, this is yeah. like my history. And what what's my plan right so here's the thing about breast health is that there's no one doctor that is your breast health doctor right like yeah. people falsely assume that their obgyn is taking care of it but really they're focusing on you know down there so that is really not they're, they're not trained on breast health you know they're not up to date on the latest recommendations for breast cancer screening guidelines and dense breast tissue and who needs to see a genetic counselor so it's like it's not their fault. It's like the healthcare's yeah. fault, like the healthcare system's fault. Like we have this problem yeah. where it's like, you know, a lot of people use, especially when they're in their twenties are using their OBGYN as their primary care doctor. And that's really not the, 
the role of the OBGYN. So mm -hmm. like you, they're probably the one who will do a clinical breast exam every few years. So by default, they're probably your, you know, in charge of your breast health. And I, it's unfair to them because like I said, they're not trained. I actually have been trying to work with residency programs, trying to incorporate some, like at least like a two week elective of like breast cancer screening, like what we mm -hmm. even do, what does a mammogram look like? What, yeah. you know, what is a biopsy? Like, these are the kinds of things that they just don't know. And I think a lot That's of doctors so are interesting. Are, yeah. That's it's so it's a problem. Because I, nope. I actually, I never, I didn't, I never thought about that, you know, because I did kind of assume, like, I have a primary care doctor now, but I also like in my twenties, that was my OB. Like, you know, that was just, it just made sense to me at the time. Right. And, you know, just thought that that was also taking care of the rest of my health, but right. It's, I think it really emphasizes, emphasizes the point that we have to be our own breast advocates, right? Like yeah. they're, they, they might not be up to date on the latest literature and recommendations from the society of breast imaging, like a radiologist is, but like, you're not going to meet me until there's a problem. So there's the disconnect, right? So yeah. that's why also my platform is so important to like educate people and even doctors. I have a lot of healthcare professionals that follow me and they're like, yeah. I did not know this, you know, like this is not something that we learn in medical school. So yeah, there's, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a systemic problem here as well. But again, you know, going to the advocacy portion, I really am a strong supporter of the monthly self-rest exam. Yeah. And this is even controversial, right? Because let me, let's just talk about the self-breast exam. So the self-breast exam is when you check your breasts at least once a month, ideally around five to seven days after your menstrual period. But honestly, do it at least once a month. I like to say feel it on the first because also like you, I love alliteration and it's just easy to remember. I always do a cute post about it. Um, and then I use my little handy, you know, <laughs> breast health model from Nerdbugs, which I love. And basically you're just looking at your breasts for any changes, skin dimpling, uh, rashes, you know, there's more symptoms that, that breast cancer can present as than lumps, right? Mm -hmm. Especially if a breastfeeding yeah. patient, which we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, so looking for subtle changes, like looking your breasts in the mirror and then actually physically touching your breasts, you know, using circular motions. And ideally this is done laying down or with your arms like above your head or in the shower. But again, it's just about doing it every you know few weeks just to make sure that everything is unchanged you know people a lot of times will say you know my breasts are lumpy well that's how your breast feels when they stop being lumpy or there's a start to have like you start to have a lump that feels different or harder or getting bigger these are the symptoms that we should not be ignoring breast swelling is a common one or redness to your breasts these are all things that you know yes it can be mastitis but if it doesn't resolve then we also have to be worried about breast cancer so, you know, if you, so I always tell people, if you find, a, if you find an abnormality, if you find a change, pay attention to it over the next few days, but in the meantime, start making a doctor's appointment. And by that time it might resolve. Right. And then we probably know it's nothing to worry about, but you know, it, it's, I always encourage people to, you know, if they do a physical exam, just make sure that they're taking your complaints seriously. And they don't just say you're too young to get breast cancer. And it's just a clogged duct. I always encourage patients to say, how do you know that it's not anything more serious? Is there any kind of imaging tests that we can do to make sure that it's not breast cancer? I know it's rare, but like, I'm just being, like, you let's know. rule this out. Yeah. Like, yeah, like exactly. Mm -hmm. So taking that next step of like, what can we do to make sure this is not breast cancer is a conversation that I think we need to start having with our providers, challenging mm -hmm. them a little bit. And if they don't know the answer, then like, you know, maybe they refer you a breast, can a breast specialist, which there are breast surgeons, you know, nurse practitioners, there's lots of breast specialists, but we just want to make sure that we're not just, you know, ignoring or dismissing symptoms without appropriately evaluating, right? We know that's called medical gaslighting. It's a thing, especially in young women, especially in pregnant patients, especially in breastfeeding patients, where it's most likely going to be a clogged duct, but again, it, it could be breast cancer. So we want to make sure we rule that out. Yeah. And also I hear that another really good thing to do with your self breast exams is to just really like to take note and, mm -hmm. and just know what your body does look like, you know, yeah. really examine to know what your body looks like. So that way you can, 
you you're kind of more attuned to something that is different versus yeah. like I can't remember was that really there before or right. something like that so there's like that consistency factor of like checking exactly and like if you choose the same time each month like I think that's also important part is that because like, mm -hmm. like you know a few days after your menstrual cycle it might be very lumpy and tender so maybe that's not the greatest time to do it. But, you know, as long as you choose a, you know, a time and be consistent about it and just set a monthly reminder or feel it on the first. And yeah. there's plenty of us that will that provide, that will kind of shove this message down your throat. Yeah. But about 80% of young people find their own breast cancers themselves. This is especially important in the, in the population where we're not screening with, you know, routine mam mammograms and things like that. So it really just, you know, we, we know there's an increase in young breast cancers. We just have to be vigilant. Wow. Um, why haven't they moved it down even further? Like, why haven't they I moved mean, the age down? It's, it's a constant battle. I mean, we have, you know, American Cancer Society not recommending self-breast exams, but they recommend breast self-awareness. So it's like, what what is the difference? It's, you know, it's all, to me, it's gotten very political um, and gotten very, like, you know, mammograms cause cancer. No, they, you know, like at the end of the day, we just have to be vigilant, especially with these increasing you know, rates of young breast cancer. I just think that, you know, you're, like I said, you're your own breast advocate. Oftentimes yeah. you're the first one to find the abnormality or your partner finds it or just something peels off. You just have to, you know, trust your body. Yeah. Listen to your body. No, that's, that's all really good information, especially, yeah. you know, about, being your best advocate, that's just like pretty much across the line, right? Anywhere, yeah. for any, any health related issues, especially totally. is that like, there's, there's not anybody that's, that's trying to make sure that you are in the best health. Like that's gotta yeah. be you, that's and gotta you. be yourself. So, right. um, you know, definitely encouraging to be, you know, e encouraging others to be their own best and breast advocate. Yeah. Totally. Um, I, I also want to point out that also when you're doing a self breast exam, make sure you're including the clavicle in your armpit because your breast tissue can go out that far. Yes. Yes. I've even heard that like you can even like it, it goes out that tissue. far and you can even have breast milk coming out. Yeah, from you can. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> so, you know, so again, like, you know, if you feel a lump, it could just be normal hormonal breast tissue. But again, it's, it's usually very easy to tell on imaging whether it's something that needs to be worried about or biopsied. So just um, from the radiologist's perspective, we usually start with an ultrasound under the age of 30. Okay. And starting at age 30, we do a mammogram and an ultrasound if you have an area of concern. Okay. And sometimes even if the imaging is negative, it is very suspicious based on your, like, you know, physically it's getting larger. We might even send you to a breast surgeon to like biopsy it. So it, it, you know, breast imaging definitely plays a role, mm -hmm. um, an important role. And also, you know, just a clinical level of suspicion is important too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, ever since I started Titty City Design, I like, there's so many, there's so many really cool things that have come out of that and a lot of connections and building a really cool, what I call community and oh I like that <laughs> yeah you know again get a little pun in there and yeah uh -huh. so in in this community people feel you know more comfortable reaching out and I I love it because mm -hmm. I can I I've started to gather different resources you included right that mm -hmm. like I I can just help direct other people to but what has been kind of alarming to me is that since since starting this like I've gotten dms from you know people in their 20s and 30s that found out they have breast cancer and it, and same, you know, and it's just, it has been blowing my mind. And I, it, it definitely made me hyper aware and made sure that like I was on top of my own self-advocacy and wanted to be able to use my platform to help encourage others as well. Um, but one of the, one of the, actually I've heard this from from several people now, like there's two, two people in particular that mm -hmm. had reached out to me. One being somebody that I went to high school with that found out during their breastfeeding journey that they had breast cancer, like we were yes. before. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
Is that something that's common? Can you talk about that a little bit about like why? I would love to talk about that. Yeah. So um, breast cancer, unfortunately, is the most common cancer during pregnancy and the postpartum period. So pregnancy associated breast cancer is when you're pregnant or the year postpartum. Okay. Okay. Um, And there is a rise in that. um, There is a rise in pregnancy associated breast cancer. It's associated with increasing maternal age. So, you know, as mothers' ages get older, we're seeing slightly higher rates of that, of, you know, pregnancy associated breast cancer, unfortunately. Um, And they typically are diagnosed at a later state. They usually have worse outcomes. And it's not that they have more aggressive tumors, it's that they usually have delayed diagnosis. So it can be hard, you know, I think people are hesitant. I think a lot of doctors tiptoe around pregnant patients, right? They don't want to hurt the baby. They don't want to hurt the mom. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, I think it's really, again, we have to take these breast complaints seriously. So it can be very confusing, right? In the, in the pregnant or breastfeeding patient, because your breasts undergo a lot of hormonal changes that are normal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most of the, and there's lots of benign things that pregnant women, women, women can develop. And most of the, you know, most of the breast changes that pregnant women will feel are benign, but it's out there. So, you know, and like I said, there is this increase, um, there is an increased rate during pregnancy and breastfeeding. So it's just something that, you know, again, this goes back to advocating for yourself. If something feels off, if the baby just suddenly stopped latching from one side, that's actually a sign Mm. that, you know, something could be going on in the breast. So pay attention to those types of things. Like all those things are important. And again, don't be afraid to ask for imaging. I wanted to say- Is there something that you can see in your actual breast milk or is it- No, nothing that you could see. But but I think on the cellular level, the baby might be able to sense something going on, which is kind of cool if you think about it. Yeah. Um, It's like a protective measure for the baby, right? Like they sense that something's going on. Um, so is that also uh, curious? Like, is that also like, if there's like a cancer diagnosis, like that's no more breastfeeding kind of situation. Well, there's no harm. I don't believe, but you know, that you just, when we have a diagnosis of breast cancer, we have to Mm -hmm. start treatment. I actually just had a recent podcast episode with, um, my friend, her name is Dr. Elise Cardonic. She runs an Instagram called cancer and pregnancy. She actually herself is currently battling rectal cancer, but she specifically deals in cancer during the pregnant and postpartum period. And um, sorry, what was the original question? If, <laughs> like if you should stop breastfeeding or like is oh, there harm or like- No, what? there's no harm to the baby, but like you have to prioritize the mom's health with yes. minimizing damage to the, to the baby. So if there is a diagnosis of breast cancer during pregnancy um, or in the postpartum p- period, we, you know, they take into account your gestational age. They might change the approach of how they treat it based on, you know, if you're pregnant or not, um, whether they, they might do surgery versus, you know, before chemotherapy, they're trying to, to you know, the, the thing they want to try to avoid is also having premature labor. So all these things come into play. So there are special, sorry, that's getting a little off topic, off topic, but meaning pregnant, you know, breast cancer during pregnancy can be treated. Pregnancy during, you know, postpartum period, uh, during the breastfeeding tar- period is a little bit better, but it might preclude you from breastfeeding your baby if they're going to start, you know, doing surgery or chemotherapy or things like that. So that's really where it comes into play. Got it. Okay. Um, but like, I know you had asked me about imaging during pregnancy and breastfeeding. So I wanted to just talk about that for a moment. Yeah. So in the pregnant, in the pregnant patient, you actually can do mammograms safely. Ideally, we'd like to wait till the second or third trimester. Um, so if you're, if you're due, you can get a mammogram. The, 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 the rate, the, the radiation dose of the fetus is extremely low especially because there's several layers, there's placenta, there's amniotic fluid there. So it's very minimal. I mean, you could always put a lead shield on if you're really worried about it. Ultrasound is, has no radiation. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we could definitely do um, during pregnancy. Obviously we usually, 
you know, in many cases, we'll start with ultrasound and do a mammogram if they're if it's age appropriate. We cannot do MRI during breastfeeding. I mean, sorry, dur sorry, dur that's not true. During you cannot do MRI during pregnant while you're pregnant okay. because the gadolinium, the the dye, will cross over to the to the baby. So we can't do that, but we can do mammogram and ultrasound during the pregnant when you're pregnant. Going to the breastfeeding in the postpartum period, you mm -hmm. can do all breast imaging. Okay, you can do okay. mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI. Your breasts are going to look more dense and more active on all these studies. So we, for mammogram, we usually tell people to, you know, feed the baby right before or pump, um, you know, and store the milk. There's no Just need empty, to pump. empty everything out. Exactly. There's no yeah. need to pump, pump and dump after a mammogram and ultrasound. Mm -hmm. With MRI, you know, you might want to maybe dispose of one round of milk after your MRI, but it is something that you can have while you're breastfeeding. Okay. Your breasts will look more hormonally active, meaning we're going to see a lot more background enhancement mm -hmm. um, or normal breast tissue enhancing, which can make it a little bit harder to read the MRI, but we can usually work around that. Okay. That's all that's really, helpful. Right really down. helpful. It is. I mean, like, yeah. because these are kinds of things that a lot of people just don't know, right. not to mention when you are pregnant and when you are postpartum, there's, you, you're already like tapped out on what you are oh, yeah. able to process and you're exhausted physically, emotionally, all, all mm -hmm. of the things. And so it's, it's nice to, you know, have some information or just like some knowledge. So you're, mm -hmm. you're attuned, you're aware before you're going to have to do something or just, totally. it's, it's just, it's helpful information. And, um, and it's so helpful really for people to know, to it's helpful for you to know this information because your doctor might not even know this information, right? Like they might yes. say like, you can't get a mammogram, you're pregnant. And you could say, that's not true. Like I, the dose yeah. is extremely low and you know, um, use this as a resource. Yes. So. Well, and it's so true. I mean, I remember when I was pregnant, like it, people just don't want to touch you. Like they're just, Oh yeah. Nope. They're scared. They're, they're scared. Everybody's scared of, you know, what, what can happen and don't want to be the, anything responsible for something happening during your pregnancy. Totally. And so that makes sense too. And you're, you can't neglect your own health and all yeah. that at the same time. So there's, there's yeah. definitely this balance and, um, and being able to be, be aware with your own knowledge so that you come to those conversations and can help, help guide them versus like waiting to hear it, especially when right. you're in, in that state, like I said, like pregnant or postpartum, it's there, yeah. you're dealing with a, a lot of, a lot of other stresses mm -hmm. at that time. So yeah, that's true. I will mm -hmm. also tell you though, that pregnancy and breastfeeding are protective um, things. They will lower your risk of developing breast cancer over your lifetime. So um, even though, you know, breast cancer is the most common during pregnancy and postpartum, in the postpartum, oddly enough, it also is a protective thing. So yeah, one of those things that it doesn't is, really make sense. Yeah. A health protective. Yeah. I, I heard that a lot too. And mm -hmm. is it, does it matter like the length in which you breast, breastfeed to which yeah, like, the longer you protection? Yeah. The longer you do it, the, there's that there's more significant, um, you know, uh, benefit over six months. Okay. But, like in the longer you do it, the more protective it's like kind of a protective state when the estrogen is a little bit low and the progesterone is a little high and that's where it comes from. Okay. That's good to know. So, yes. But yes, by breastfeeding, you are doing your, your baby and yourself some good. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking all about breastfeeding and breast cancer and screening and all that. And um, I also wanted to just talk about mammograms in general. So like, yeah. you know, pregnant or not, you know, breastfeeding or not, let's, what do we need to know about mammograms? Like, I know there's, there's lots of myths out there of like, uh -huh. it hurts. Like how long does it take? What, like, what, what's it like? Can you share mm -hmm. kind of your experience? Yes. I mean, I have a few great reels from when I got my first and second mammogram. So I highly recommend watching those. 
but it really is not as bad as people make it out to be. I mean, you're so just the, you know, it's going to be a little painful. I could always tell people if you want to minimize the pain, try to schedule it again, day seven to 10 of your menstrual cycle. And also you can maybe take an Advil an hour before um, to minimize the tenderness. But I had one, I thought it was like, a, I'd say a five out of 10. I think it's, I, I know that some people find it extremely painful. I think it depends on the person and the technologist that's performing the exam, mm -hmm. but like going with an open mind, right? Like it's not comfortable, but yeah. you know, it gets the job done. Um, when you're going for your mammogram appointment, you want to make sure that you're not wearing any deodorants or creams around the breast area. Cause often that can show up on a mammogram and look like calcifications. Mm -hmm. You always want to bring any priors if you had any, um, because comparisons are extremely helpful. So, you know, if you maybe had an ultrasound when you were 18 years old, try to, try to find those, you know, if it's in the last five to 10 years, it can be very helpful. Okay. Um, especially when we're trying to determine stability. Yeah. And the, and the technologist essentially takes two different pictures of each breast. They squeeze it like this. They squeeze it from above. This is called the CC view. And then they kind of squish it in an oblique view. Um, typically if you have implants, there's an extra set of images we take where we kind of push the implant out of view to get those images. And really the mammogram itself takes under, you know, five, 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, most places you leave, you know, if it's a screening exam, meaning you're just coming in for your annual screening checkup, you have no complaints, usually get it and uh, your doctor gets the results in, in, in three business days and you get them within 30 business days with a letter. Um, if you have something called a diagnostic study where when you're coming for, an, like you're coming because you have a complaint, that's mm -hmm. a little bit different. You're going to, um, you're going to get the mammogram if it's, you know, if you're over age 30 or the ultrasound under age 30. And then if it's a lump, we always typically do an ultrasound after that. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that appointment, then the, the, the radiologist will usually give you the results that day, whether you know, it's nothing to worry about. It's just tissue or if it's probably benign, which is a category a lot of people fall into. That's when we're saying it's less than 20, it's, a, it's less than 2% chance of that being cancer. We typically follow those patients for a little bit at short intervals or if it's something that needs to be biopsied. Mm -hmm. And even when we do a biopsy, when we're, when we're recommending a biopsy, most of them are going to be benign about, you know, if you get a BIRAD score, which is a category that means we see something that's suspicious and we need to do a biopsy, about 80% of those will be benign. Okay. So even if you do need a biopsy, most likely it will be benign unless you get something called a BIRADS 5, which is like a highly suspicious finding. Like we're the radiologist that's interpreting the, you know, the imaging is pretty certain that this is cancer and they're going to buy it, see it, but also if, the, if it comes back benign, they're going to say, I don't buy it. And it needs to get, you know, evaluated further by a surgeon. Um, about 10% of people get called back from their mammogram. Um, just to give you some numbers. Okay. So like a hundred people come in for a mammogram, mm -hmm. 10 of them will be called back from their mammogram saying something's abnormal. We need to do additional testing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of those 10 people that get called back, um, six of them will be told it's nothing. It's, it's benign. It's negative. Nothing to worry about. Two of those people will be told it's probably benign. Like I said, that's that short interval category. Two of those people will end up needing biopsies. Okay. So, you know, out of the original hundred, it was two women will need a biopsy just to okay. kind of give you the numbers of what to expect. Okay. okay so even if you get called back, you know, again, it's too early to start freaking out. I always say like, you know, 60% of the people that get called back will be told it's nothing to worry about and you're good. Yeah, yeah. But that so. wait time is probably pretty uncomfortable. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, the anxiety yeah. is real or the yeah. anxiety that one feels when waiting for the results of an imaging test is real. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, at the end of the day, knowledge is power. We know that early breast cancer detection leads to better outcomes less morbidity and mortality and just overall, you know, less aggressive treatments means you're going to get back to work quicker and you're going to, you know, maybe yeah. have less arm swelling, things like that. Those are all the things we have to consider. Yeah. Wow. Well, this was all really, really helpful information. And I, I really so appreciate glad. you taking the time and like getting 
you know, getting really detailed about it, you know, because a lot of times we're just kind of like, just know a little bit, but I, I feel right. like you really, you, you went in and gave some really good, like a little, a, a bit deeper of a dive into it. So I, yes. I really appreciate that. And um, I think everybody that's listening to will as well. I'm going to make sure that this is live for Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which is yes. October. And yes. you're going to be hearing a lot from Oh my box gosh. during that time. <laughs> already. Like I like, but like all yeah. good things are coming up. So yeah, yeah. Um, well, tell us a little bit about that. To, like, um, you know, is what what's coming up for you? I, I know little whispers of something like a booby bash. Oh uh, yeah. So I'm having my first ever fundraising event called the Booby Bash. Um, if you're in South Jersey, Friday, October 20th, 7 to 10 p.m. in La Salas by or Marlton, it's gonna be the most fun party ever. I've been wanting to do this for about two years and it's finally happening. All the proceeds are going to an amazing breast cancer organization in Philly called Unite for Her. Um, so highly recommend checking them out. And um, yeah, hopefully yeah, we have- okay. You'll have to send me, send me all that information. I'll make sure I include it um, with this. Um, with this episode and share on social media as well. So a night of, of positivity. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Positivity. I know. Actually the theme is like Barbie. So it's gonna be like booby land. This is booby land. Oh my gosh. Wow. I'm I can't <laughs> wait to see all the TikTok content and God. Instagram content. Oh, that's amazing. And I also <laughs> have some really exciting upcoming like um, news appearances. So hopefully I'm not going to jinx anything, but some exciting things coming down the pipeline. So follow the booby docs to keep up with all the fun things that I'm up to this month. Yeah, that's awesome. I love, I love getting to see your segments. You're featured all over the place Thank and um, it's amazing. So I'm Thank so glad you. that we are breasties and that we Me too. found each other. I think it's, um, you know, that was just so meant to be. It's so cool how that did we just become happened. breast friends? Yeah, just become breast friends. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, I also yeah. want I want to say for those who are looking to take a deeper dive into more breast cancer related content, I have a podcast myself called The Girlfriend's Guide to Breast Cancer, Breast Health, and Beyond. Yeah. So hopefully, we're going to be releasing this on both because I think this is such an important conversation about breastfeeding. Yeah. Um, but certainly we have, I have a bunch of episodes about, you know, I, I say it's designed to help anyone who's navigating a breast cancer diagnosis personally, or a loved one that has a loved yeah. one that's navigating. So amazing. And I'll make sure to share that information as well. Thank so, you. and yes, it will be this, this content will be available on both platforms and, um, Thank you so yeah, much. and I'm so, I'm so happy we got to make this happen. So thank Me you so too. much. Thanks for listening to our Titty Talk today. Stay tuned for our next Titty Talk, where we connect with more real people that are part of the movement, the social movement we started to break the stigma around boobs. Check us out at tittycitydesign.com, where you can find the Let's Talk Titties blog, or follow us on Instagram and TikTok, at Titty City Design.